Look at what the Bible says regarding this whole sin issue. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. Amen. Next verse. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Which means before all of that, I was dead in sin. But it was by the grace that I received from God that I could stand before him and now be justified. I can now stand before God and I can be called one of his. I can stand now before God and be able to say I am a child of God. I thank God for his grace. Now many people will try to say, well, hey, you can live like this and you can live like this because we saved by grace. Don't try to get caught up in that. Yes, we're saved by grace. Grace means that I should have killed you, but I gave you favor not to kill you. Another part of that grace is listen I'll give you some time to get yourself together so stop talking about Jesus paying it all on the cross yes he did so he would kill you right now so thank God for the cross thank God for the blood thank God for his mercy and thank God for his grace to allow you to get yourself together right now so let's look at this real quick number one you can write it down Bible says, look at what it says. This is the first point. The point that Paul was making to the saints in Rome. What was Paul saying to the saints in Rome? He was trying to let them know something in Rome. Look at Romans chapter 3, verse 23 through 24. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And so he was letting them know all have sinned. We all sin. This is why people really can't get themselves together with God or get right with God. Because we don't look at ourselves as being sinners. We don't look at ourselves as having been as bad as we, you know, that, that, that the scripture is letting us know. When you stand before God, you are garbage. Paul said, like, dumb. But many of us will look at it and say, I ain't no dumb. I ain't that bad. Then you have people say, I ain't gonna kill nobody. I just showed a little white lie. I ain't, that's all. But when you think like that, then it will keep you from getting to where you need to be in God. Because you part of you think that a little bit of you is okay. But when you really recognize who you really are, that God is holy, and that you are a sinner, then it will put you in the right place with God. That's why people, when they want to receive the Holy Ghost, they begin to look at themselves and say, God, I'm damned without you. But that's why people don't want to take even counsel from the Word of God, because part of what you feel is kind of right. So if I tell you something from the scripture, you might take a little bit of it, but there's part of you saying, I got some little knowledge too. And when you think like that, then it's hard for you to really get saved and be right with God. Because you're looking at yourself like, I'm not really that bad. And what Paul was trying to point out to them that was in Rome, letting them know you were that bad. You were evil. You were wicked. You were wicked. You were in sin. When you see yourself as a real sinner, that's when God is able to help you. But if you feel like, well, I'm not really that bad. I try. I do this and I do that. Cancel all that foolishness and just say, Lord, I need to be saved. Help me. But when you don't have the desperation of that, part of you are saying, not really that bad. You want to come to the altar? Well, I guess. You going to lift up your hands? Your pious attitude, your posture is what he's trying to point out to them in Romans. Don't walk around like that. That anybody that understands how great and mighty and holy God is, it makes you to the point, if God came into this place right now, none of us can stand before his glory. Nobody could stand before him. John even said when he turned around, he fell dead. 
So when God comes into the picture or the presence of God comes in the picture, you recognize that you're standing before a holy God. And this holy God can have the right to kill you and kill everybody around you. Which is what he was trying to let them know in the book of Romans chapter 1. But when you have this mindset, you need God? Yeah, I do need him. Then that's the wrong attitude. Do, do, you, do you love God? Well, yeah. You going to church? Probably not today. That's the wrong attitude. The mindset should be, I need all of God that I can get. And I'm willing to lose everything to get him. Who cares about you? Who cares about that? Who cares about this relationship? Who cares about her? Who cares about him? Who cares about this money? Who cares about none of this? I don't care about this house. I don't care about the clothes I got on. All of this stuff is garbage before him. This is what Paul was trying to say. He said, look, I am the Hebrew of Hebrews. I know everything. I know the word. I know the law. I was perfect in the law. But when I begin to look at how God is holy, I am nothing. I am garbage. I am dung. So that's why he had the mindset, God, I got to do everything that you allowed me to do, which is why he said, I was the last apostle, but I was the greatest apostle. Why? Because when you look at somebody that has been in sin and you have delivered them, that's why you would sit there and say, somebody that had been a prostitute that was out in the world that was on drugs and they get saved. When they get saved, they on fire from God. Why? Because they can say, I know how I was. I was in the trenches. I was dirty. I was in this, I was in that, I smoked, I lay with everybody, I got HIV, I got gonorrhea, I got all of these diseases, so I know where God brought me from, so when you say somebody like that, they are grateful, but let them say somebody they never really do been through nothing, I give them a little clap, I say a little hallelujah, cause you ain't really been saved from nothing, you think you okay, you think you look little bit good, but God says you are garbage, you are in sin, and you need to be saved, you you need to submit and surrender and then bow down to the king of kings. So look at verse 26 to 31. I read it very quick, very quickly. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where it is boasting then, it is excluded. But what law? Of works, nay, but by the law of faith. Look at what it says. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Notice what it says. Is he that is he the God of the Jews only? Because the Jews was trying to say, well, he's our God. Y'all Gentiles are dogs. He's just our God. Because we follow the law. We know the law. We know his precepts. We know his statutes. We know his commandments. Y'all, y'all can never really be where we are, which is that whole thing about prejudice. People being prejudiced. You look at somebody that's not your color. You sit there saying, well, they this and that. This is not a black church. I always tell people, this ain't a black church, people of God. This is the church of the living God. All colors and all backgrounds, all pedigrees. Everyone is supposed to be coming to this church. So don't look at anybody that's not your color or not from your background. Acting like they hate. No, they hate. You need to go to the white church over there. The devil is alive. Everybody needs to be in this house. Everybody needs to be saved and hear the gospel. The gospel is preached to everybody. So this is what he's letting know in 29. He said, is it he the God of the Jews only? That's a question. Is he not also the, of the Gentiles? Yes. Look at what it says. Of the Gentiles also. See, it is one God. Somebody say one God. One God. Okay. Say it one more time. One God. One God. And his name is Jesus. Which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. What is he trying to let us know? Just because you say by grace don't mean you don't supposed to follow the law. But you can't follow something perfect if you don't have what you need to be able to follow the law. I have the Holy Ghost in the inside of me to help me follow something that is perfect. So without the Holy Ghost, you cannot be more like God. Without the Holy Ghost, you cannot be like Jesus. So don't try to take the book and try to read it for yourself thinking you can get closer to God. You need the Holy Ghost. Which leads me to my second point. We are servants of righteousness. We are servants of righteousness. Look at Romans chapter 6 verse 14 and 18. Look at what the Bible says. For sin shall not have dominion over you. 
Ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under the grace? Look at what it says. God forbid. Now notice what it says right here in verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. What is that saying, people of God? That whoever you obey, that's who you serve. Everybody claiming to be children of God, but whoever you obey, that's who you serve. And people today don't know that they're serving the devil. You can't serve the devil and God. You can't live like this world do and then continue to say, well, I, I love God and I serve God. No, you can only serve one God. And whatever you do in your action determines who you really serve. The whole thing, actions speak louder than words. That's what that's talking about. Somebody took that out of the Bible. And so whoever you serve or whoever you obey, that's who you serve is what he's trying to say. Whether of sin unto death of obedience unto righteousness. Now put it in the NLT. Make it simple for that verse right there, verse 16. So I make sure that you understand what I'm saying. Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Look at verse 16. Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? So say for instance your school, young people. The school telling you that you need to do this. Uh, girls, y'all need to wear this. Ladies, y'all need to wear this. And guys, you need to do this. And you need to do that. And you follow that. That means you have obeyed what they said to do. If it's against the word of God, I'm not following no way. If it's against the word of God, I'm not following it no way. Some people will follow the things that they'll say because this is what they did or this is what they did. And I look at it like this. I don't know about you, but I had, when I, uh, the company that I work for, um, if you were Muslim or any other faith, whatever time they had to pray, they would leave their desk and go somewhere and pray because of the time that they had to pray. But we as Christians, we will go by whatever's been said to us. But if you look at other, de other de uh, denominations and other different religions, they gonna stick by what they believe in. But with us, we bend on everything. We bend on everything. Why? Because somebody else said this or somebody said that. But if the word of God doesn't say that, don't bend to that people of God. Don't bend to it all. Verse 17, but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. Look at what it says, verse 17 in the KJV. Go back there, please. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed. Look at what it says. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of what? But God be thanked that ye were servants of sins. I used to be a servant of sin, but what happened? But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, which was delivered to who? You. To you. What doctrine did they obey? What doctrine does the Bible talk about? What doctrine does the Bible give us? The only doctrine that the Bible gives us is the apostles' doctrine. There's no such thing as a Methodist doctrine. There's no such thing as a, 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 a Jehovah Witness doctrine. There's no such thing as a Catholic doctrine doctrine. There's no such thing as the seven day Adventist doctrine. All of these different doctrines. The only thing or the only doctrine that the Bible shows us is the apostles doctrine. That's the only doctrine. That's why people say we need to get away from doctrine because that's, that's splitting us all up. No, no, no. Don't get away from doctrine because doctrine is what we obey for us to be saved. The only doctrine that the Bible speaks of is in the book of Acts. Go to books chapter Acts verses 2 and let's look at verses Start at verses 42. Look at verse 40, 41 rather. Look at verse 41. Acts chapter 2 verse 41. Look at what the Bible says. When Peter preached that message on the day of Pentecost, look at what the Bible says. When he preached repentance, baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the filling and the filling of the Holy Ghost, look at what happened. Then they that gladly received his word were what? And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. 3,000 souls after Peter preached what he preached on the day of Pentecost. Repent, 
Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, not in the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, because nobody in this book was ever baptized in the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's a lie that preachers preach, saying you can be baptized in the titles. There was no Christian in this Bible that was ever baptized in the titles. If you did that, you were baptized incorrectly, and God is not counting it. Now, somebody will sit there and say, but I did it, though. What you mean? It still means the same thing. No, it does not. We have to follow the letter. We have to do what the Bible says to do. If you don't do it the way the Bible says to do, he gave it to the apostles, the disciples, to give to us. And how do we know that God was stamping their approval? Look how many people were saved or added. 3,000 souls were added to the church when it said this. Now look at verses 42 and what it says. 42 says, and they continue steadfastly in the what doctrine? Apostles doctrine. In fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So if anybody preach any other doctrine unto you and it's not the apostles doctrine. That's why we are an apostolic church because we follow the apostles doctrine. We follow what they preach holiness. We follow what they preach repentance. Baptism in the name of Jesus. Filling of the Holy Ghost. We don't follow these other type of doctrines and other man made doctrines that are out there. We follow what the apostles preach. Amen. 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 Look at what it says, verse 18. Go back to Romans 6, verse 18. Romans 6, verse 18. I'm hasten to close. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. This is why we need the Holy Ghost. Because without the Holy Ghost, we cannot even love right. That's Romans chapter 5, verse 5. You really can't love somebody without the Holy Ghost. That's why I tell young ladies, when they say, well, do you think you love them? Or you tell the guy, you think you love them? Well, I want to know, does, do you have the Holy Ghost? Because without the Holy Ghost, you can't love nobody. Right, That's why we tell people, don't get married real quick until you find out this person is in love with God. Because if they love God, they can love you. But if they're not in love with God, they're not going to love you. Because the only way that you can truly love, Holy Ghost got to be on the inside, which is Romans chapter 5, verses 5. And hope make it not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by what? The Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So without the Holy Ghost, you cannot even understand the spiritual things. That's why sometimes people will tell you certain things. You tell somebody certain things, they'll look at you crazy like, what are you talking about? They can't understand it. So don't get mad at people when they don't understand spiritual stuff. Because why? They don't have the Holy Ghost. I tell saints, don't get upset with your parents and family and all of those who don't get upset with you when you try to tell them something from the scripture. They don't understand it. They don't have the Holy Ghost. And if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you don't belong to him. Let me show you what I'm saying and not just be talking. Romans chapter 8 verse 10 to 9. Look at what the Bible says. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now look at verses 5. We don't walk after the flesh, but we walk after the spirit. Look at verses 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Which is why you say, you going to church? No. That's flesh. But those who are after the spirit says, yes, I love God. Those who said they're after the flesh, you want to read the Bible? Uh-uh. But those who are after the spirit, yes, I love reading the Bible. Those who say I'm after the flesh, well, hey, we can do this and we can go to the club the next day. After the flesh. But those who are after the spirit say, uh-uh, I can't live like that. I can't do that. So you have to ask yourself, what are you after? What, is your, what are you being driven to more? Of the things of the flesh or the spirit? You can say that you love God. You can say all of these things. But God will be able to let you know. I'm like, no, you're not. You're after the things of the flesh. You want more things of the flesh. Look at verse 6. For to be carnal minded is death. But to be spiritual minded, it is life and peace. So don't let nobody tell you, you too spiritual. You too spiritual. I can't stand with you with too spiritual. You want to be more spiritual. We need more spiritual people than we need fleshly people. 
So this whole mindset, you too spiritual, you know earthly good, they read that from the scripture, that's not what they're saying. And people are taking it totally out of context, what it's saying. Because look at what it says in verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity or hostile against God. But it is not subject to the law of God, neither can it, neither indeed can it be. So you can't expect somebody that's not saved to follow the laws of God. So that's why when somebody do something crazy on the street, I can't expect them to, to, to do what's right. They don't have the love of God on their heart. They're not saved. They don't go by the law that we do. That's why they don't say, why you didn't do nothing? I don't live like that. I would have told this person, I know why. You in your flesh. You ain't saved no one. You would have did this. I know why. Because you're not saved no one. I, I, why, why I can't do this? I know why. You, you, you're bucking back. Because you're not saved. No way. You're following your flesh. But notice what I said when I said that no, if you don't have God's spirit, you don't belong to him. Because everybody is claiming they are a child of God. Look at what it says. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You cannot please God in your flesh. Now watch verse 9. And many people get upset when we say this to them. When they say, I'm a child of God, if I come out to you and say, no, you're not, there's a lot of people that they get mad. Anybody believe that? If you told somebody you don't belong to God, people will get mad at you. But the scripture lets me know if you belong to God. If you belong to him, look at verses 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you, now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If you don't have the spirit or the Holy Ghost as how they got it on the day of Pentecost, that when they received it, they spoke in other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance. Many people have preached, once you believe, the Holy Spirit comes on the inside of you. Many people have preached that once you get baptized, you get the Holy Ghost. That's when the Spirit of God. That's not true, no way. That's not in the book at all. But somebody has told you that, and people have believed that. But without God's Spirit, you do not belong to Him. You are not His. So when He comes back, He's coming back for what? His Spirit. And when He calls for His Spirit, it's going to come off the earth. If you don't have God's Spirit, you ain't leaving this earth at all. So that would be like this. In, in, in Canada and some different places, they have uh, in cemeteries, they bury people uh, six feet under, on, up on top of each other. So could you imagine you being the sixth one down there and God is coming back? If you ain't got the Holy Ghost, you stuck. So when God calls the Spirit, the only way that you're going to get out from that bottom one is you have to have the Holy Ghost to get up out of there. And if you don't have the Holy Ghost, I'm sorry, you're still here. That's why we say to people, you better make sure you got the show of Holy Ghost. And it is alive in you. Don't just say it. Don't just think it. But make sure you have it. And if you got it, you better make sure that it's working. If you got the Holy Ghost, make sure the Holy Ghost is working. It ain't a switch. I turn it on today and then tomorrow I'm not saved. I turn it on right now and then later on I'm not saved. The Holy Ghost is on the inside and it is alive and it is real. If it's on the inside by your behavior and what you do, we should be able to see that's the Holy Ghost on the inside of you. Why? I can tell. What? Another experience. Your experience should match up with the scripture. Don't say you say and it's not matching up with the word of God. Everybody is claiming that they say, but it has to match up with the experience that is in this book. And so what Paul was telling to the Roman church, he said, listen, don't let them tell you about the laws and all of these things. We're saved by grace through Jesus Christ. We have to follow what Jesus Christ is telling us to do. And if you're really saved, you you're no longer a, 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 a slave to sin, but you're now a servant to righteousness, and we have to live right. Amen. Let us stand. I didn't get into my third point, but I'll have to revisit it again. But the Bible lets us know that we can be saved if we call on the name of the Lord. That's Romans chapter 10, verse 13. The only way that you can be saved is you have to call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so if you have not called on the name of the Lord, what am I saying? To be saved, you need to repent. 
You need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or the removal of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And so everyone that is saved in this place that have been baptized or filled with the Holy Ghost, don't do what the Jews did in the word of God. That we look at other people and begin to talk about how sinful they are. But you yourself are still doing sinful things. Because that makes you a hypocrite. And so if you're going to be saved, as I say, be saved. If you're going to live right, live right. If you know for a fact things are wrong, then don't continue to live in that sin. But repent and ask God to change your life, your mindset, so that your soul would be saved. Don't allow anybody, no one, to cause your soul to be lost. You have the opportunity now. And God says, I've given you grace and mercy for your soul to be saved. After you hear messages like this, what would make you leave out of here today the same way that you came in? What would make you leave and just say, well, I just went to church. I heard a message, sounded pretty good, but I'm gone. And I'll probably come back another time. I had a good time. I'll probably come back another time. That lets me know. And God, most importantly, they really don't feel or know how much they need me. But if you need God, you would run to him. And you would try your best to seek after him day and night. And God knows if you're seeking after him. So there's somebody here today that has not been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. If you know for sure or you don't remember how you were baptized, why don't you be for sure and be able to say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel and I'm not afraid. I'm going to go ahead and make sure that I was baptized correctly. Peter said unto them, repent. Be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you believe it, you will obey it. But if you feel like I got it, and I'm good, you'll leave the same way that you came. And I say to anybody, if things are not going right in your life, if things seem chaotic, what God wants to do is bring organization to your chaotic life. And the only way that's going to happen is Christ has to be ahead of your life. If you want to come out of the chaos, why don't you come to Christ so that your soul and your life will be saved? Amen? Amen? We're going to pray. If you want to come to the altar and pray, you can come. And I pray that you're learning. And I pray that you're growing here in the house of the Lord. If I had more time, we can go more in depth. But I know time is against us. So let us lift up our hands unto God right now. Father God, we thank you. We've read your word. We thank you, Lord God, for allowing us to hear and to see and to read. But Lord, you don't want us to just to be hearers of the word, but you want us to be doers. I pray that we would get to a place that we truly hunger after you, that we truly thirst for righteousness, that God, we don't stand before you like we have it all together. Many of us right now are in sin. Many of us, Lord God, have not confessed and have not come clean because God, we're thinking that we're okay. But Lord, I pray right now that you will touch our hearts, oh God. That we will recognize that we're standing before a holy God. That Lord God, we will get ourselves together. And we will allow the things of this world, God, to make us feel like God, we're not really who we really are, oh God. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that we humble ourselves unto your word. And that God, we know that we're nothing and that we can do nothing without you. But it's by your grace and mercy that we're standing here right now. And Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the opportunity to let me know that I can get myself together. Right now, God, as we leave this place, let revelation come more to the minds of what they've heard, God. Bring these things back to their remembrance, oh God. Let them think on them when they go to sleep at night, God. Help them to understand that they need more of you, oh God. That once they understand and we understand clearly, God, of what we are and where we came from, that God, we will see that we need more of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we give you glory. We give you honor and praise. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Clap your hands up to God. Tell your brother and sister you're glad to see them tonight. Hug them and tell them to come on back to church on Sunday. 
We'll be here on on Saturday outreach and come and help us in Jesus' name. Hug your brother and your sister. Hug them before they leave out. Hug them and tell them, hey, ask them how they get baptized in Jesus' name. Tell them you want them, come on, come on and be baptized in Jesus' name. God bless you, God bless you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Oh, the closer walk with you. Jesus is my plea for you. Hey, walking close to me. Oh, let it be. You know, let it be. Just a closer walk with you.
Hey, I'm saying, it just seems like, oh, whammy. When I get behind it. It'll be like that at first, but it'll be, it'll be 